Here we go. So when we talk about dry macular degeneration, we mostly talk about uh, two different things. And I wasn't sure how to approach this. So I started with fundus findings and then segued into the OCT findings. Um, so there's two RP abnormalities. You get drusen and pigment abnormalities. Um, although the pigment abnormalities are considered more of the RP findings for AREDs and then retinal abnormalities. Um, we'll go over this over and over again. It's just one of those little things. Soft drusen, there's small drusen, medium and large, which are different sizes. And then there's drusenoid PEDs, which are 350 microns across. And then there's this new entity, um, shallow irregular RP elevations which are great in a thousand microns across. And mostly I wanted this so I could show you guys examples. Uh, reticular pseudodrusen, calcified drusen or atrophic drusen. I don't really have a great example of those. So I mostly wanted this to be a picture show. Uh, soft drusen look like this picture. This is the left and right eye of a patient I saw this week with a uh, little soft drusen. I have a close up here. So the characteristics of soft drusen are, you see the bright RPE line kind of going over the drusen. And the drusen deposits is all this stuff underneath the RPE. And then like David mentioned in that talk, you get this double layer sign where you can sometimes see um, Brooks membrane. Although it's probably not all of Brooks membrane because I think the basement membrane of the RPE is probably up here. And then this is probably more the basement membrane of the Coyo capillaris. So these are typical soft drusen. You see the retina kind of going over them. And this person should have good vision. One thing you want to start looking at is the external limiting membrane when you're looking at these, which is this inner light line. So you've got your RPE line, which is actually this one. And then you've got the ellipsoid zone here, and then the external limiting membrane. The RPE line in a, in a normal OCT, an eye without disease, is usually split into two, kind of like it is over here. But when you get into here, it kind of runs together. So it's tricky. Um, so that's soft drusen. And then the other characterization is confluent drusen, which is just soft drusen running together. This is a funny image. This is one of my patients with a lot of drusen and absent in the middle. Um, so here's absent drusen, and then you get these confluent drusen just running together. So you see there's the hook's membrane back here, and then you got your RP up here, and then you get all this junk underneath. Reticular pseudodrusen are totally different. And some people think these, some people call them subretinal drusenite deposits. Um, they're not drusen, they're, they're pseudodrusen. So there are these funny looking spots, not in the center. You see them better on the infrared image, these little dark spots on the infrared. They tend to be kind of up here, sometimes down here. And then on the OCT, they're actually in front of the RPE. So it's distinct. So here's your RPE line here, and then here's these little reticular pseudodrusen. These are pretty common when you get into your really old patients. When you get 85, 95 year olds, you'll almost always see reticular pseudodrusen. They have not been integrated well into the uh, grading scheme. Here's another case, an 88 year old patient with poor night vision. It's pretty common to have poor night vision. You see these little spots up here on the infrared, they're more visible. And then when you look at the OCT, you see the RPE line's pretty straight. And then in front of the, oops, in front of the RPE line, you get these little bumps. So those are reticular pseudodrusen. They're different from soft drusen. So those are kind of your two main drusen. There's the soft drusen and the reticular pseudodrusen. This is this shallow, irregular RP elevation, the sire, which is a new thing, which uh, I think David in that lecture said that Phil Rosenfeld calls this the double layer sign. So you got the RP coming up. It looks like kind of you would see in soft drusen, but then you've got the Brooks line down here, and then you've got this material, but it, this is really big. This is like probably 2,000 microns across, and then there's another thing over here. So these are greater than 1,000 microns across. They're small, and they tend to harbor neovascular membranes about a quarter of the time. This is, excuse me, this is a color picture in an ICG of this patient, and the ICG shows a neovascular complex, but it's, so it's non-exudative neovascular complex, but sometimes these are dry. So that's a shallow, irregular RP elevation or a double layer sign. Um, so those are your drusen. And then RP abnormalities are, car are categorized separately for classification, but also for the purposes of learning. So there's the, the RP abnormalities always confuse me a little bit. So there's focal hyperpigmentation, focal hypopigmentation, and geographic atrophy. I had to really dig for these, and I had to take all these from new pictures because I don't want to take pictures of dry materials. Uh, 
Um, oh, so Dr. this is, Cohen? Yep. Oh, can you hear me? Quick question about the sure. sire. You said it's a non exudative neovascular complex. That's a new thing. At 25% of the time, there's a neovascular membrane. This patient has one. And so this uh -huh. is considered a neovascular membrane here. It is a neovascular membrane here because you see it on the ICG. Um, but there's no fluid. So if there's no fluid, okay. and there's no lipid, and there's no blood, it's considered non exudative. And this, is, this was something you couldn't do with fluorescein. So it's a new thing. And it's especially new with OCT and geography. Um, so there's a new category. And this has been characterized. I want, this is, if you go out a year or two years, one or two years, the risk of them converting to exudative is about five or ten percent. Um, David referenced this study that his friends, I think, up at Tufts did, where they tried treating these patients to see if it changed the outcome. It didn't seem to matter very much. The fact is, they're pretty benign. This patient, I think, this specific patient has been seeing me for five or more years with the same lesion and actually has really good vision, um, 2025 vision. There's been this thing, for, what are we doing? there's been a thing in ophthalmology for a while that in some neovascular membranes, in some people may be physiologic. They may actually help nourish the retina, which is kind of a weird concept. Um, there's an old pathology study, histopathology study, very old, probably 40 or 50 years old, where I think Dick Green found neovascular membranes in an enormous number of um, eyes of elderly people. So it, it may be that you're sprouting these little things to help the retina. But, um, but anyway, so yeah, it's non exudate which is a, a very weird idea. Um, RP abnormality, oh sure, RP abnormalities, you got focal, uh, hypo and hyperpigmentation of geographic atrophy. The cutoff, I don't think you need to know this, the cutoff for geographic atrophy is 175 microns. It's actually in the textbook. I, I had to go back to the textbook to find that. So focal hyperpigmentation, I've, what, on an OCT, it looks like these little hyper, interretinal hyperreflective spots. So here's a patient with these big drusen or drusenoid PEDs. Here's a little pigment spot here, and then here's what it looks like on OCT. So in, as far as we understand that, that's RPE kind of detaching, or pig, pigment, melanin detaching from the RPE and kind of migrating into the retina. And this is often a precursor of geographic atrophy or atrophy when the pigment starts to be bad. Is it incorrect to call those pigment migrations? No, no, I think that would be probably accurate to pigment migration on pigment migrations. Um, it's, it's, uh, when you're reading an image though, you don't wanna get too far along. So if you have all of this, you can say, oh, these are pigment migrations. But if you have just an OCT, just call them interretinal hyperreflective spots, which is, a, it is actually, come into common parlance. So there's several things that can be interretinal hyperreflective spots, but one of the big ones is pigment. And you can see a little shadowing underneath it. This is another little hyperpigmentation, kind of, again, there's a little disruption of the RPE by this bump here, and then there's a little spot there, and then if you look under, this is pretty subtle. That's not a really good one. This was a better one. This is, these are all literally from the last four days. So this is a patient that had a bunch of these little pigment spots. And when you scan them, you can pick up these little interretinal hyperreflective spots. Um, so that's focal hyperpigmentation. Focal hypopigmentation is a little tougher. I, I, I think it's just little atrophy spots over bruising sometimes. It's, I have trouble calling focal, focal hypopigmentation um, or spots that are too small to be called geographic atrophy. So this is a little light spot. You might say that's a bruise, but it's a little irregular with some hyperpigmentation. So I thought that might be one. Here's one with two spots, the same eye. There's a bump over here, and then there's sort of a little atrophic area starting over here. And so this is the first spot over here, and this is the second spot over here. So I consider those little areas of hypopigmentation. You know, if, if this is normal pigment, oops, if this is normal pigment here, then that's light. So that counts. Um, and then here's a patient with geographic atrophy. Here you see the little patch of geographic atrophy near the fovea, and then here you see on OCT all the findings where you have you lose your retinal layers here, so you got your retinal layers coming in from the side, and then there you don't have them. Your RPE kind of goes away there. You're just looking at the membrane or some depigment in RPE. And there's even like a little outer retinal tubulation guy starting, and then you get the hypertransmission, so you get this reverse shadowing. And then geographic atrophy, this is a 94-year-old woman with mild vision loss. And again, 
you can see sort of the atrophy here, every the light's going through. And then there are these little incomplete areas of geographic atrophy kind of all over the place. And then here's another patient with small areas of geographic atrophy. And you see the light going through, a loss of the normal architecture, your outer retina starting to come out totally broken. Um, pigment epithelial attachments. I couldn't find a serous PED, but I do have a um, pattern dystrophy. Pattern dystrophies are interesting because the, the deposits in front of the RP. So here you got your RP, you got the little irregularity, and then you have this pseudo vitelliform lesion, we call it, with the hyper reflective material under the retina. And then I'm going to quickly go through retinal findings. This will just take another minute. Um, this is the intraretinal, intraretinal hyperreflective spot we talked about with the pigment right there. And then here's an outer retinal tubulation. So you get these little circles that are hyperreflective all the way around, and they look like a cyst, but they're not. So here's a patient with geographic atrophy and a little bit of um, outer retinal tubulation. And if you follow these, they look like tubes. If you if you do whatever, on plus OCTs, or you kind of do sequential OCTs, they run through the retina. You can get subretinal fluid in dry AMD. This is a dry AMD patient I've been following for a while. She's got these drusens. People think this is like a drape. I think it's probably more that the RPUs just kind of sick here and can't get rid of the fluid. I do find they tend to be sort of toward the middle of the fovea. I think the very center of the fovea has some trouble with, with fluid in, in certain disease entities. And um, this is a dry AMD. So you got to be a little cautious. Would you treat that? No, absolutely not. And I have an ICG. And nowadays you can do OCT angiography to confirm that it's dry. The other thing to warn you, which I didn't put in this talk because I want it to be short, is, is you can have dry AMD and other diseases. Like I have a fascinating patient with dry AMD and macular telangiectasia who's been to a lot of retina people. And the good ones, the ones that recognize the macular telangiectasia tell her you don't have wet AMD. And the other ones say, oh, you have wet AMD because it looks like what I do. And you can get pseudophagic CME. So that's why sometimes if you have something that looks like, or diabetics, I've seen, I actually had a patient recently who was diabetic and a very good retina specialist thought it was wet AMD, but it was diabetes. So just because you have AMD and you have fluid doesn't mean it's from the AMD. Um, like that choroid's a little thick, but you have to look at it. And then outer retinal atrophy is a very common thing. So you look, you see your outer nuclear layer, here's all your layers, they're intact. And then you go here and you get this, you've got loss of your outer nuclear layer. You get loss of the external limbing membrane. And like I said, the external limbing membrane tends to go with vision. So you like to look at that. And that is it.